All right, what a great venue. I need more smoke, though. Can I have some more smoke? Okay, so I struggled about three or four times on which content to give you, and there really isn't a correct answer, but I had some fascinating discussions last night at the speaker's dinner, which made me completely change my mind one more time. So we're just gonna roll with this. I think the purpose of a keynote isn't necessarily to give you just yet another talk. I think it's supposed to expose you to something you may not normally see. I think it's supposed to make you think about something you normally wouldn't think about and maybe even challenge you a little bit. So I wanna show you some of the content that we've been showing outside of the security conference. In fact, I haven't really been to very many hacker conferences in the last year and a half because some of us have decided that we really can't fix many of the things that we've been working on if we just talk to each other. So we've been trying to turn into ambassadors that can translate and yes, use the word cyber. So anyone that gives me a hard time about cyber and makes me have to drink, we'll have plenty of drinking later. Uh, but also this is one of the words that the outside world has to use and we have to hold our nose, uh, eat our lima beans and try to do so. Um, really quickly so I can gauge the audience. And by the way, I love people to live tweet or to start a discussion with me at either one of these handles. Um, so, even though we groan at the word white hat, and maybe some of you don't even think there are any white hats, one of the hardest things we have to do is we start talking to different governments and different regulatory agencies and medical device companies or automakers, is they are totally afraid of this community. They have no idea why anyone would want to hack their stuff. They think that you're primarily there to extort them or that you're a risk. And I've been trying to put some names and faces to why people do what we do. And this is an oversimplification, but I've basically, over the last several years, distilled it down into why we do what we do, and I essentially boil it down to five Ps. You're either a protector that wants to make the world a safer place, or you like to defend random objects. You're either a puzzler who do does this for curiosity, or to figure things out, or to take them apart and put them back together because you like a really hard challenge. You do it for prestige or pride because there's a healthy amount of ego in this industry, but that's not a bad thing. It might just be that you want to feel really good about your accomplishments and your body of work. Then there's the profit motivation, which is a lot of us make a living off this. We might not have started that way, but this is a, a lucrative way to sustain our lifestyles and our families. And then some of us do it for protest. We're either for something or against something with more of an activist bent, but still in a lawful way. And what I find is most of us are really strong at one of these, and we have uh, a secondary as well. So just by show of hands, who primarily identifies as a protector? Okay. Who's a puzzler? Lots of puzzlers. That's not surprising. Who does this for the, to be a rock star, the prestige and the pride? All right. Well, I, yeah, of course. And, uh, and then protest or some, some sort of cause. Anybody? Okay. So I major in protector. I want to make the world a safer place. But I also can't lie, I really like a challenge. So I'm really a protector slash puzzler. Now I can tell there's not that many hackers in here because I only see about three hoodies and all hackers wear hoodies. All right. So I don't know what motivates you on an individual level, but regardless of your motivation, I think there's some, some substance in here if you look at what we say to the outside world. So try to Think about your own motivation as we discuss this. So even though I'm talking about where bits and bytes meet flesh and blood, uh, which is very much oriented towards a protector class, these are really, really, really hard problems. So if you're bored and you're sick of popping shell or it's just easy enough to find the 700th piece of Android malware, some people are finding more satisfaction in trying some of these much harder problems. Much, much harder problems. So let's jump in. Um, I'm gonna show some of this. I have to use story and metaphor, so if a few of you I know have seen this, you'll just have to tolerate it. I'll do a shorter version of it. Um, I did a TEDx talk to try to make my neighbors understand cybersecurity and why this was a big deal. And I had it all sketched out. I knew exactly what I was gonna talk about. And then I went shark diving with uh, Dave Litchfield. He loves to go shark diving. And I finally had a chance to go with him before DEF CON three years ago. And I realized I have to completely rewrite this thing around sharks. So here we go. I love them. I used to go to school for marine biology. Um, I wanted to study sharks and dolphins and things like that. I ultimately got a degree in philosophy instead, and I went to computer science and got into programming. But uh, 
I think they're pretty awesome. In fact, before I die, I want to see a school of hammerheads. It's the most beautiful thing, and it's very rare to see because, in general, sharks don't like people. They stay away from people. They don't like the noise that we make. Now, you can go swimming every single day and never see a shark. Now, as I scuba dive over my hobbies and over vacations, sometimes you'll see a shark in the distance. Maybe you'll see a little one. Maybe it's curious. But in general, they just don't want to bother with us. That's all until there's blood in the water because they are an apex predator. They are one of the most perfect organisms in the history of the planet. And as soon as there's blood, a different part of their brain goes into a different mode. They get curious, they get hungry, they get frenzied, and they come around. So uh, when we tried to do this shark dive, we asked a bunch of our friends to go. It's a fairly expensive thing. We wanted to subsidize the cost by splitting it. And everybody made excuses. Oh, I have to go to my wedding, my friend's wedding. I have to, I have to get my hair done. Or, oh, I'm, I'm working on my DEF CON presentation. Um, my boss at the time was Andy Ellis of Akamai, and he said, what kind of an idiot would get in the water with an apex predator, right? He was just judging us because he thought it was a completely stupid risk decision. So he was maybe right, maybe not, but I wanted to see them. So we went out three, three hours off the coast of Cape Cod in Massachusetts. We put some dead fish in the water, and within less than five minutes, this little guy showed up. It's a blue shark. It's about eight or nine feet long, if I recall. Um, it is initially curious, but it very quickly got mean. Um, I don't actually like blue sharks that much of all the different sharks, but it, it was pretty amazing colors when the sun hit it. Um, you know, usually when people see this, they say, man, he's stupid. But I like to remind people that David Litchfield took the photo. Um, and, <coughs> and it was worth it to me to see this. So I wasn't, I wasn't bothered yet. Now, insecurity, though, if you're wondering how this is a security talk, we have this ridiculous belief that we hold, which hasn't been true in a long, long time, that we don't have to swim faster than that shark, we just have to swim faster than our buddy, right? So I don't have to worry as long as he's the one eaten. But we forget that the sharks also have buddies. This picture was taken 30 seconds after the one of me, right? So he turned around and there were two more. So the idea that, you know, ah, uh, you know, we just have to be slightly better than our competitors or slightly better than the other guy, that assumes we have very, very few predators and it also assumes that we, don't, we have very similar motivations. So he had to very quickly get back in the boat because the photograph after this one wasn't very uh, legible, but it was the inside of one of their mouths as he was hitting it back with his camera. And if you think these are pretty bad, uh, this was his prior dive. But at some point, shortly after he got back into the cage with me, we had five, we had six, and they were very aggressively trying to liberate us from that cage. Um, but it got, at some point, I got worried. So even though I was protected, they were successfully grabbing at my leg or my hand or whatnot. And I said, what kind of an idiot gets in the water with an apex predator? Because they move quickly, they move deliberately, they're faster than you, they're stronger than you. I had no business being there. Why the heck would we expose ourselves to that level of risk? You have to be stupid. So at some point, I wanted out of the, out of the water, we got back in the boat, but I didn't truly feel safe yet. In fact, I wasn't gonna feel safe until I got back to the safety of what? Say it, the safety of dry land, right? Now, unfortunately, we had three hours left before we could get back, so instead of just panicking the whole time, we just kind of just talked about the state of the cybersecurity. Now, a couple years ago, some of you know I did this, but people thought I was an idiot for studying these guys, and Jericho and I spent about a year and a half writing a series called Building a Better Anonymous, and we had some artwork done by our friend uh, Mar from the 303 Hacking Group, and it was a stupid thing to do because they had successfully punished anybody that talked about them at all. Like the idea of, if you remember Aaron Barr, they destroyed his career. Now he did more than talk about them. But it was a risk that we were willing to take at the time because we knew it was significant. Not because of their hacking prowess. Many of you in this room, you know, turn your noses up to Anonymous. But it was, it was consequential for a bunch of different reasons and we didn't in exactly know why until we got into it. But what I really re think is appropriate for today, of all the lessons we could take out of it, I think were two things. Number one, in spite of having very little skill relative to others, they were wildly successful taking down nearly every target they had. If you remember the 50-day summer of lulls, they just punished company after company after company successfully. I said that they held a mirror to our neglect because here we are talking about espionage and APTs and sophisticated malware, 
and they're just trashing us with really simple SQL injection and cross-site scripting and DDoS attacks. So they really showed us how poorly we've operationalized basic hygiene. And number two, they kind of showed the entire world that this thing called hacking, this new form of power, existed and was available to anybody who wanted to assert their will onto others. So it wasn't that we were safe and that we'd done a good job in cybersecurity, it's that we had not been tested by these different species of sharks. On the other end of the spectrum, you do have the state-sponsored stuff. And a lot of you last night at the speaker's dinner were talking about you know, uh, kill chains and indicators of compromise and how to do anomaly detection on a really granular level and how to look for O-days and the O-day market. And those are hard problems too, right? They're very hard problems. But the thing is, you don't need a sophisticated attack if a 10-year-old known vulnerability that no one bothers to patch still works. Right? So while we do have to be concerned about the nation state adversaries, um, they're at least more rational and controlled in their behavior. But regardless of which of these two extremes we're looking at, I think it's kind of just true that attacking things is really, really easy. I'm not trying to denigrate any of the hard work that you guys do, but relative to defending something or attacking something, has anyone never had a anyone in here had a pen test where they didn't succeed? The failure rate's nearly 100%, but we'll get to that. So ultimately, three, years, three hours after the, the shark dive, we did get back to dry land. I did get on my knees. I did physically kiss the ground, you know, symbolically. But I, I didn't really feel safe because there's a part of your reptilian brain, your fight or flight, that can't really have higher function until you feel safe again. And as I did it, that safety and that, that wellness that washed over my body lasted about 30 seconds. And the reason for that is I looked at my brand new connected vehicle my new computer on wheels. This thing was as high tech as I had seen in a long time. It was three days old. And I said, wait a second, the internet of things is a tsunami. We are swimming in connected technology. We're putting Bluetooth and 4G LTE Wi-Fi hotspots onto everything. And we too have apex predators. So then for the third time that day, I heard Andy Ellis' comment, what kind of an idiot gets in the water with an apex predator? We're deliberately exposing ourselves to, to someone who has much more control over that domain because offense is easy and defense is hard. So adding software to something makes it weaker and adding a connectivity to it makes it exposed. So the Internet of Things is the Internet of hackable and exposed things. So this is not my car, but think about a modern vehicle. You don't turn a key, you press a button. And you watch an operating system load. And you watch it connect to your devices and to the Internet. There's 69 computers in uh, a car from just six years ago, 69 separate computers. So we say it's a computer on wheels, but it's really a network on wheels. And if you know what Chris and Charlie and others have done, this is not new news, but it's very new for the audiences that we've been trying to talk to. Very few people understand just how connected a vehicle is. It controls your steering, your brakes, your power. Every aspect of your car has some sort of software exposure. We're putting software into our bodies. If you knew uh, Jay Radcliffe or the work that Barnaby Jack had done, you have Bluetooth stacks sitting on an insulin pump that can kill you, and there's almost no authentication or no effective authentication sitting between you and someone that may wish to harm you. Right? And it doesn't need an adversary. Sometimes it's just an accident. The original thing that got Jay Radcliffe interested was a software glitch nearly killed him in his sleep. He said, if a bug can kill me, could I kill me? And the answer was yes, it wasn't very hard. And he went from manufacturer to manufacturer and found very, very poor hygiene. It's in our homes, and I don't care at all about fridges that send spam, but we are putting Bluetooth door locks and different uh, you know, IP cameras and different um, security devices in our home, and nearly every single one that our friends have looked at has been compromised. So you're buying a security product to keep adversaries out. It may be the very thing that lets adversaries in. And then I don't think this room needs to be told what Shodan is, but almost no one in these industrial controls environments knows what it is. But if you go to Shodan, you don't have to be a hacker at all. You have naked connections to the internet of industrial control systems, and you don't need a zero day, you don't need a payload to crash these things, which is often the aim of some of these adversaries, just to deny service. You just have to do a port scan. To log into them, you just have to Google search for the default hard-coded unchangeable maintenance passwords and log in with them. So as we connect all these things, I say again, what kind of an idiot gets in the water with an apex predator? 
So after a while, we kept trying to quietly get these messages to our various governments. So this isn't a US thing. We've gone to several of your governments, and we've gone to The Hague, and we've gone to the EU, and we work with ANISA. And at the time, at least three years ago, we kept looking for the cavalry to come save us. You know, at the end of the Western movies and the, the Italian Western movies, the horses ride over the hill and save the day. And what became very, very clear is it's not coming. No one's going to save you. So three years ago, almost exactly, at DEF CON, we did a call and we said, if the cavalry isn't coming, guess what, guys? It falls to you. Right? You have to be the cavalry. So the cavalry isn't Josh Corman. I'm terrible at this stuff. But the idea and the recognition was that we had to be a voice of reason, technical literacy, ambassador, and educator. And we had to outreach to our public policy makers. We had to outreach to the public at large. And more importantly, we had to work with these industries where bits and bytes meet flesh and blood. So the problem statement that unified us was that our dependence on connected technology is growing much faster than our ability to secure it. So we're adding the exposure faster than we're tearing down the risk. And in a lot of these cases, what we know how to do, even if we do catch them up to enterprise security, enterprise security doesn't work very well at all if we're being honest with ourselves. So I'm going to argue to you we haven't had a consequential cyber failure yet, not even one. We could debate that, and we probably should debate that tonight over drinks at the barbecue. But even the big ones, right? Ashley Madison embarrassed some people. Target only got the CEO fired. The OPM breach, which was very scary for a lot of people, not that bad. And the reason I know we haven't had a consequential failure yet is nothing has sufficiently given us a kick in the ass to say, maybe we need to do things differently. So it hasn't triggered a corrective action. And a lot of us that have been closer to this, we realize we need radically different approaches to IT. We have indefensible digital infrastructure. We're going to have a consequential failure, and you'll know it's consequential, because the consequences of failure will not be measured in number of records, and it won't be measured in replaceable credit cards, and it won't be measured in stock price. It'll be measured in human lives, right? It'll be measured in a crisis of confidence, where people no longer trust connected medical devices or connected cars, and it has a a material hit to a nation's economic gross domestic product or GDP. And you'll know that we have a consequential failure when the reaction to that fear is we compromise our freedoms, our surveillance, we add more surveillance, we add bad laws, we start to criminalize research, we start to put more people into the Middle East in physical conflict. So I am much more concerned about a crisis of confidence that triggers these real damages because those fear-based responses are going to compromise everything we care about. And they won't probably make things better. So a lot of the, the mission of the cavalry is not that we think we can avoid these high consequence failures, but that we want to be more prepared when they come so the reaction is more intelligent, more thoughtful, more measured. So as an example in history, um, at least in the US, we polluted like crazy. We were just dumping all sorts of chemicals and byproducts into everywhere. There's an, a river in Ohio just after the 1900s that caught on fire and stayed on fire. It was called the Cuyahoga River. And you had to see a burning river on fire for so long they couldn't put it out. That was the billowing smoke. Those are the, the, the fire hoses. How do you put out burning water, right? Throw more water? Finally, that was the high consequence moment where they said, you know what, we probably should stop polluting so much. And they added a bunch of laws, some of them good, some of them terrible. And some of those terrible laws are still in the books. But you kind of need that moment. So instead of talking about a cyber 9-11 or a cyber Pearl Harbor, I'm really lately talking about a cyber Cuyahoga moment, something that triggers the consciousness and says, we need to do something different. Now, these are not them, but these are starting to get close. As much as we make fun of it, in fact, Jericho and I made it, did an entire talk making fun of how there's been more outages in power plants due to squirrels than there have been uh, due to hackers, we finally have the first confirmed power outage in the Ukraine due to hacking activity, first confirmed one. We talk about Shodan, but we also have confirmation, and it's very quiet confirmation, but slowly some of the Department of Justice uh, court files have been unsealed and there have been confirmed attacks. There, this particular one was a hydroelectric facility in, excuse me, a water facility 
in upstate New York that an Iranian hacker successfully manipulated the controls on. Now, in this particular case, they unsealed it because it wasn't that scary, because there was no water in the facility, and at most it would have flooded a golf course. But this shows existence proof that people are attempting to manipulate industrial control systems over the internet. The one that really bothers me, though, was an accident. This is Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital in California. And a piece of ransomware, SamSam, -Sam, successfully altered the hospital network so badly they couldn't take patient care anymore. They had to divert ambulances to other hospitals. They had to move people from critical care to other hospitals. If you're on life support, do you want to be moved to another hospital? So this is where things are getting really, really worrisome. No one got hurt in this particular example, but this is not good. And what's not good is if an accident can take out patient care. What could a, a deliberate, sustained denial of service do? And the answer is, if you wanted to, for any hospital in any country, hospital technology is so bad, and we are so exposed, you could pretty much shut down patient care for weeks and weeks and weeks if you wanted to. Because they can't just shut off the internet. These devices don't even work without connectivity anymore. Because our dependence on connected technology grew faster than our ability to secure it. So back to Anonymous. When we were, we, I don't think Anonymous is going to go hurt hospitals, by the way. But when we were researching them, we didn't care what they were doing per se. We said that this is a blueprint that will be copied and perfected by others. And just to get heavy for a minute, because this is not fiction, we actually made the blueprint. It's the first page of the first section of the blog series. And it's undeniable, if you look at current events, that ISIS and Daesh have perfected the blueprint that Anonymous created. Their use of social media and asymmetric power and recruitment and the, and the, the promulgation of ideas is working. It's completely taken uh, the UN and NATO by storm. We, it was unprecedented, unexpected, and every attempt they do to use social media against them doesn't work. But what's more troubling is, unless you studied an Anonymous really carefully like we did, you might not even have noticed this story. But there were very few hacking groups in Anonymous. One of them was Team Poison. One of them was Lulsec. One of them was Cabin Crew. But in Team Poison, a UK citizen named Trick, he radicalized after our research was done. And he joined ISIS, and he moved to the caliphate. And he was recruiting other hackers. And while he was not you know, a world-class zero-day finder, you don't have to be. He had enough skill and knowledge of how to hack that if he wanted to, he would be able to do something to Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital or any others. No, it's harder to attack power plants. It's hard to attack, it's not hard to attack the cars, but you have to get familiar with how cars work. So we have exposure in lots of these places. But the kind of attacks that take down these hospitals, they're running Windows XP, unpatched. They have no network segmentation. You know, basic common malware accidentally did it. So I'm much more worried about this type of an adversary. Because when you connect everything to everything else, it doesn't matter what most people would do. It matters what one would do. And we're just not set up in cybersecurity to handle everybody, right? We focus on financially motivated ones. Because if I'm faster than my buddy, they'll just move on to a softer target to save time. Or we focus on espionage. Because if I have nothing to steal or if I can sue them, we have some sort of response. So back to that consequences of failure thing. Think about this and tell me I'm lying. A hundred of the Fortune 100 companies have had a loss of intellectual property or trade secrets in the last three years. Anyone going to call me a liar? A hundred. Every PCI merchant that lost credit cards was PCI compliant. Am I lying? The failure rate is 100%. On a long enough timeline, we fail 100% of the time. So why haven't we screamed? Why haven't we revolted? How can we claim that we're being successful? There's answers. One of them is, as long as the fraud rate doesn't go above 4%, it's acceptable. <laughs> and as long as you don't see a company go out of business, the intellectual property loss is acceptable. But I'm going to ask you, is a 4% increased death toll in these safety-critical industries acceptable? We're nowhere near as good 
in the safety critical industries as we are in the private sector. We, we spend tons more money on credit cards than we do on human life. And that's because that's where the adversaries have been. But the truth is, we're no, if we added all that good best practice to your cars and your medical devices, we would still fail about 100%. Now somebody's probably saying it can't be this bad, right? There's gotta be something he's leaving out. And I think one of the differences, and you have to use your imagination just a little bit, it's not the fact that people are gonna die, right? And when you start talking to policy people, I just changed jobs to a policy think tank, and there's, they think very differently. They don't care as much about what we talk about. In fact, I'm gonna quote a statistic. There were 32,000, more than 32,000 deaths in cars in 2014 alone, and just in the US, 32,000 deaths. So clearly we don't get that worried when people die in cars, it's just, what happens, people die. But what is concerning is when it's an exotic death, right? We were talking last night at the speaker's dinner about how much outrage there was in Germany over the New Year's Eve attacks and the sexual assaults, and it was terrible. But the point they made, I think, was that there's more of those every year at um, Oktoberfest than there are, but it's the exotic and terrifying nature of it. So it's really the, the fact that we'll, what will trigger that crisis of confidence is if we no longer trust our medical equipment, if we no longer trust our connected cars, that's where you're gonna see the bad outcomes happen. It's less a matter of technology and more a matter of confidence. So the bigger fear is that were some of these attacks to happen, were someone like an ideological attacker to exert their will onto public safety, the bigger issue isn't the attack, it's that there's nothing we can do about it. If you recognize this picture, anybody see this? You know what this is? All right, this is the oil spill, the BP oil spill. It was on the news every single night because all systems fail, that's not the surprise. The surprise was they couldn't close the leak for, for weeks. And that's the concern I have in the hospitals. There's really no good response plan. So we were talking at dinner last night about well, you can't prevent anything, so you have to detect and respond. Sure, um, but when the, the, the thing you're detecting and responding to is people just died, there's really no ability to go unkill them. There's no good uh, this defense loop. But moreover, um, we really can't stop the attack because you can't stop the connectivity and we can't make these unpatchable devices all of a sudden patchable. And we can't make these Hospitals all of a sudden have enough money to get rid of Windows XP systems. And I'm not making excuses for them, but the bottom line is we're completely exposed and we don't have a good strategic or tactical plan for anything to do about it. Now these are gonna sound really boring, but this is where the industries are at and we have to start at the crawl stage so that you can walk and run. So I'm not giving them a bunch of you know, advanced best practices. What we've been doing is we publish these things like this first one was on our first birthday uh, two years ago at DEF CON, we said, look, cars are computers on wheels, all systems fail, you need to be prepared for failure. So they're going to get hacked. Are you prepared for that? And all we basically said was, um, you're masters of your domain, we're masters of our domain, now the domains have collided, we have to uh, work together and we can be safer sooner if we do so. Safer, sooner, together. So the idea, which I'll show you in a, a few minutes, is if all systems fail, tell your customers how you avoid failure, tell researchers you will take help avoiding failure without suing them. How do you capture, study, and learn from failure? How do you have a prompt and agile response to failure? And how do you contain and isolate failure? And they're saying that they won't be ready for these any earlier than 2025. So if you guys think this is really basic stuff and you'll still be able to hack cars even if they do these, you're right. But they're so far away from doing this that we have to start somewhere. <clears throat> Similarly, this January, we published the Hippocratic Oath for connected medical devices. And again, it's basically the same controls, but we had to map it into something that doctors, physicians, and, and medical professionals understood and valued. And the core to their profession is first do no harm. So they really identify with the language. So it's less about finding new O-days and more about packaging our knowledge in a consumable way that they're familiar with. I'm gonna skip ahead because I took a while on that front end. But the urgency should really come from the fact, not that we have added the connectivity, but now that you're seeing these attacks, even the accidental ones, again, you can swim in the ocean every day and never see a shark, but when blood is in the water, they come quick. And my 
deep concern about the Hollywood Presbyterian example is even if ideological adversaries weren't thinking about this, they've now seen it on the news. They know it's available. Blood is in the water. So I think the timer has started. So just a quick look at the Hippocratic Oath, one of our deliverables. I based, this is, these are slides I showed them. I said, look, all systems fail, all of them. So you need to be ready for failure. This is a graphic from Information is Beautiful. We know very few things about computer science, but one of the things we know is there's a defect rate per 10,000 lines of code. Actually, per 1,000 lines of code. Some people measure it that way. So there's some flaws every 1,000 lines of code. The more code, the more problems. I used to have a Biggie Smalls photo I took out. But if an operating system had about 10 million lines of code, and we know how often we patch those, right? We patch them monthly. A car has over 100 million lines of code and climbing. So there's bugs in there. And anyone that says there aren't is st stupid. It's just science. So when I was talking to the doctors, um, I said, using the shark metaphor, we're going to need a bigger boat. Because essentially, um, in the healthcare arena, a piece of legislation in the US basically broke the industry. It said, uh, we're not going to pay you for new medical equipment unless you can have meaningful use, which meant you had to have connectivity to share electronic health records. So they took all these devices that were never designed to be connected to anything else, and they said, we're not going to give you money unless you can connect it to stuff. So no threat modeling, no risk assessment. They just added connectivity to all sorts of old models. And I said that was the original sin as to why we have such wildly indefensible medical infrastructure. If you think about it in terms of a car, it's not the number of lines of code that bothers me. It's the number of remote attack surfaces have grown. So we've had software in cars for a long, long time. But we have near field, we have Bluetooth, we have app stores, third party app stores. That's safe. Um, the head end unit is really the center of the car. So if you can compromise that, it's on the same CAN bus. And once you're on a CAN bus, you have unfettered access to everything else. So I care less that Chris and Charlie could hack the Uconnect stereo in the Jeep. I care more that that access point allows them to shut off the brakes or kill the, st or kill the steering or kill the car. Right? So then once you start talking about can it be hacked, of course, and then you talk about can it be hacked from anywhere, yes. There's 4G LTE Wi-Fi hotspot standard in all these vehicles. Then you have to say, well, yeah, but no one would hurt us. right? There's no money in it is what Chris and Charlie said. They're wrong, there is money in it. But aside from that, the first adversary in every threat model should be Murphy, Murphy's Law, right? Bugs happen. So it's not just adversaries, it's accidents in adversaries. And second of all, there's plenty of people that would hurt you. I wanna know that they couldn't. You know, we don't have to connect everything to everything else. There's no law requiring it. We do it because we think it's awesome, right? So we, we put out this Hippocratic Medical Oath, and I already said some of this, so I'll go faster. These are the fancy names, but basically, how do you avoid failure, take help avoiding failure, notice failure, um, respond to failure, and isolate failure? How do you separate critical systems from non-critical systems? And they're really far away from doing this, really far. And, and it, because you guys are all smart and logical, the argument we were having with them is, there, Josh, there is no evidence of hacking. And I said, guess what? Unless you have the number three, you'll never have evidence of hacking. So the Food and Drug Administration was waiting for proof of harm. They wanted to see confirmed deaths due to hacking before they would take an action. And there was absolutely no requirement to have any proof. So they were never going to get it. And if you followed this last year, the Friday before DEF CON, they put out the first ever recall of a medical device for a Hospry or drug infusion pump that Billy Rios had found a flaw in. And we had convinced them slowly, using models like this, that an un unmitigated pathway to harm is sufficient to trigger a corrective action. So you don't have to wait until there's dead bodies. You can actually find some unmitigated pathway to harm and they'll do something about it. So really quickly, the first one is essentially, do you publish your SDL so that I can decide if I'm a hospital that you have a better SDL than someone else? Think Microsoft, right? Probably one of the best in the world, even though we used to beat on them. They're very transparent about what they do to avoid harm. The second thing is basically, do you have a published coordinated vulnerability disclosure program saying you won't prosecute researchers acting in good faith? And while you see things at Blue Hat and Google and other places, safety critical industries look at you guys as terrorists, almost, right? They're terrified of you. So is it a beware of dog sign saying we're gonna sue you, or is it uh, a welcome mat inviting research? And several of us have put a significant amount of energy into this one 
and we've gotten GM, the auto company, Johnson & Johnson, Draeger, we've gotten some of the medical devices to say, yeah, we want help. And more importantly, we got the Food and Drug Administration to almost require it. They basically say now in their new guidance, if you have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program and you fix your bug in 30 days, then you don't get a recall, which is incredibly painful. So it's not required, but you'd be an idiot not to do it. The third one is evidence capture. So think about airplanes. You know, we put these black boxes there not to spy on people. You can do it in a way without spying. But because you want to study these, because if people lose faith in airline industry, global commerce would cease. So we, we study the failure, we learn from the failure, we make the industry better through the failure. Fourth one is, you know, segmentation isolation. A submarine is structured so that any one part can flood without sinking the whole boat. And right now, unfortunately, most of these things, one compromise destroys the functionality of the whole thing. And then lastly, updates. Even though this is controversial in safety critical industries, they think updates is a point of exposure and you'd be stupid to update, they believe you're not allowed to update, all those things are false. If you're going to use OpenSSL, when something like a heart bleed happens, you better be able to update it. So what we are is dependent on all these hackable things. We have no update mechanisms in most of them. And some of you guys last night were groaning at this, like, updates are so basic. You know, I'm going to focus on IOC. Well, guess what? If you can't update, we have to get the basics in place. If it's an industrial control system that costs $30 million and is supposed to last for 30 years, and it's popped tomorrow and you can't patch it, that's a pretty expensive paperweight. So one of the things I like to, this is Katie Mazuris, wave to Katie. Um, one of the things I like to point out is 15 years ago, Microsoft was suing our friends, our cease and desist letters. And now they give six figure cash prizes. They have gotten enlightenment. So the mean time to enlightenment was 15 years. And what I'm trying to say to these safety critical industries and to you guys is they're at year zero on their journey. And I want to get them to have a mean time to enlightenment of one to three years. So if we start finger pointing and saying all the things they should do, they're not going to listen. So we have to be very patient with them, but I call it being patiently impatient because I can't wait 15 years for them to get this. And moreover, if you think of those five stars, I would say Microsoft is in the top tier for all five, and yet they still have to fix about a dozen or more critical defects every month. Most of these cars and medical devices can't patch even once a year. So we have material exposure. All right, I'm pretty much running out of time, so I'm gonna make the 30 second version of this. I kept looking for metaphors, and if people have better ones, please give them to me. But the Haitian earthquake quake killed 230,000 people. It was all over the international news for weeks, right? Really, really horrible disaster. It was a 7.0 Richter scale attack. What got almost no press coverage was a few weeks later, an 8.8 .8 Richter scale hit Chile. One of the reasons it got no coverage is it only killed 279 people. So the total devastation of damage was very different. That's why the coverage was very different. When they studied all the different contributors as to why, it wasn't the size of the earthquake, it wasn't the presence of an earthquake, it was one thing, pretty much. Building codes. Chile had modern building codes, Haiti didn't. So what shook a building in Chile, toppled a building and flattened it in Haiti. And I think where we're going to come to is it's not the presence of adversaries, and it's not the skill of adversaries, it's the presence or lack of building codes for building code. And we can't write unhackable code, but we have incredibly terrible hygiene in the things that can affect public safety, human life, or co our confidence in key markets. So one of the things I want to stimulate for the rest of the day, we're not going to get into this, I can do a whole presentation on just this one slide, is people keep saying, well, how is IoT or cyber safety different, Josh? And the simplest framework I can put on one picture is we have different adversaries than we're accustomed to fighting, so a lot of your best practices won't work. The kind of people that would do this are the kind of people like Trick. Number two, we have much different consequences of failure. It'll be life and limb, confidence in key markets, et cetera, which we've hinted. Next really different context and environment. Some of these devices are migratory. There's no such thing as defense in depth. There's no perimeter. You're wearing it on your body. Next is composition. Very different hardware, firmware, software stack. So a lot of our security countermeasures aren't designed to work on them and probably won't. They may not have enough computational power to do encryption. Massively different economics. When you're talking about the consumer internet of things, there's no profit in doing security. They'll never have a security person on staff. 
And lastly, different time scales. So some of these devices, their time to live is a year. Some of these devices, their time to live is 35 years. So a lot of our best practices don't work when you start talking about a device that has to be resilient against 35 years of future attacks. So when you factor those things together, it becomes a useful way to talk about why we can't do detect and, and respond, why prevention is going to become more important. And the bottom line is we're going to need a bigger boat. And I don't have all the answers. The five-star framework is one of them. But pardon my cursing here. It felt relevant. I, I thought of this last night. You guys seen the movie The Martian? All right? My basic assertion isn't to scare you or to tell you that all your work is crap. It's to say, we need a better solution. We finally have the, the compelling reason to be better, to think harder, to shift left in the kill chain, all those different things. We're going to have to science the shit out of it, right? There's very smart people in this room, and you got really frustrated or bored, or you're tired of popping something, so you just said, you know what, I lost some of my passion, or things are, you know, I'm just going to focus on, you know, this new project. Take your talents, take your curiosity, take your puzzler gene. If you're not a protector, be a puzzler. But think of if we couldn't detect and respond, if we had to do better prevention, if we had to do better segmentation, if the cost of a single failure is unacceptable, what would I do differently? You know, what kind of things could I invent? And that's mostly the charge I want to say to you, right? We have fun in this profession, we make good money in this profession, we have a good social environment in this profession, but no matter what your motivational structure is, if you're a protector, if you're a puzzler, if you're doing it for pride and prestige, for profession or profit, for some sort of protest, I'd like you to think, at least for a while we're here to get the next two days, about how you could up your game where bits and bytes meet flesh and blood. And I bet you, you're gonna be challenged, you're gonna be motivated, you're gonna be fulfilled. It's a really hard problem, but I know you're up for it. So my sincere belief and plea to you is that I know we're gonna get safer, I just believe we can do it sooner if we work together. Thank you for your time.